name is Sarah Deans and I'm an avian telemetry specialist working for low tech here in the UK. Um, so the aim of this presentation today is I'm going to walk you through the different technologies available for re avian research. Uh, my background is actually genetics and I got the chance to study this more in depth during my time at Bournemouth University. Rather than tracking with GPS or VHF or satellites, I was tracking using genetics and population genetics of Mus musculus domesticus and their uh, gut parasites, specifically ones like uh, Cephatica oblivata. Uh, house mice are very interesting because they have very short generation time, so there's plenty of time for genetic mutations to occur. I was specifically looking at chromosomal mutations, so um, through Robert's only translocation, mice can lose cr uh, chromosomes. Um, and you, from the data, I proved that there were three distinct populations made up of five chromosomal races across the Greek archipelago. Um, I, the, during my time at university, I did also work in tech, and then after graduating from my master's, I came and started working here at Low Tech. So the first thing to consider when you're looking at different tracking technologies is what do I want to find out? Am I interested in uh, foraging strategies? Am I interested in looking at birds that have been reintroduced as part of a reintroduction or translocation program? Um, mortality, so chick mortality or um, bioenergenetics, bio so looking at soaring data of migrating birds. Uh, I would recommend having a really good research aim uh, in mind before you start thinking about technology, but also be aware, be able to be flexible um, in what you're hoping to find out. Generally speaking, there are three different types of technologies that I will walk through, through today and I will cover today. Uh, the first of which is going to be radio telemetry. Uh, and this is the one that people most think about when you talk about tracking, so the person in the field with the antenna. Um, then uh, we'll also be covering archival, so geolocation and time depth recorders. And we'll also be covering GPS and satellite technology, uh, which has come on so much in the last couple of years, getting smaller and more efficient with their batteries. Another important, probably one of the other very important ones, is thinking about what species am I studying? So how much do they weigh? Nature is indefinitely variable, and that also applies to birds. Technology designed for avian species has to cover everything from ostriches to hummingbirds. This determines a size tag that can be used and also poses a challenge to build a technology that can withstand the wearer. So you have to think about how much do they weigh? Um, and that's because there's often ethics limit, uh, committee's limitations. So, for example, the uh, BTO in, here in the UK um, often have a 3% limit, for example, for long, ter long term or um, if they're going on the leg, if they're going on the neck, there's different weight limits to consider. Um, it's also important to think about what habitat they're using and what limitations that could pose for the technology you want to use. How long do I want it to stay attached? So with birds, they, sh they molt their feathers every year. And if you're just gluing a transmitter onto the feathers, then it's likely it will get lost before the, um, much earlier than if you're using a harness. And how far do they travel? Some technologies which we'll cover have got limited range or you have to get them back from the birds. So if they are far ranging species, that could pose a challenge. Um, this graph is a really nice sort of visualisation. It is out of date now. Um, everything has got much, much lighter. So geologers are um, 0.3 grams. GPS data loggers about one gram. Satellites go down to about two gram now. Um, GPS is sort of sub four grams. Cellular GPS is about six grams. Um, but it's just a really nice sort of visualisation of how um, the weight of the birds um, is it will limit what technology you can use. So the variety of species also gives us a variety of options to choose from when it comes to attachment techniques, um, but not all attachment options are equally good for all technologies or species. A VHF is the most flexible and can be used for nearly all options, such as legs, ne uh, necklace, uh, backpacks, so glued or with a little heart, with a leg loop or wing loop harness, uh, tail mounts or patagial. Um, geolocation is best suited to just on the leg or the back as the sensor needs to be exposed to light levels to work properly. 
GPS is also flexible and there is an incredible amount of attachment options out there for them. Though the most common is still on the tail or on the back of the birds so that the antennas can um, are exposed to the sky and can talk to the satellites. But for some species, uh, conventional attachment methods pose a challenge, uh, such as geese, for example, or um, storks. So in those cases, you might want to we'd be looking at using a collar or a leg mount for the animal. There are also long term effects to consider. So when you so studies on the survivability of species carrying tags do tend to show a negative trend towards, trend towards survivability. So you want to strike the right balance between the device staying on long enough to collect the data, but not too long so that it causes issues to the birds. Gluing on the transmitter is the simplest and you could just glue um, onto the back of the tail and will allow it to drop off when the birds mold their feathers. Harnesses will ensure that tags stay on much longer, but should include a weak link to allow it to self-detach. Um, so we're going to start with uh, geolocation. This is great for studying really small migratory birds. The technology starts from as little as 0.3 grams, which is minuscule. And it's such a simple premise. It uses light levels to record the timing of sunrise and sunset. And this, the, these light levels are used to estimate location for your tagged animals. Uh, these can also be combined with temperature depth loggers or the temperature depth loggers can be on their own and they will record pressure. So you can look at dive depth of birds, wet dry status, so in uh, saline conditions, when the birds are on the water, when they're off the water, temperature of the water as well. The limitation with them is that they are very, because they're very basic and they're just using light levels, the accuracy is only to within 200 kilometers outside of the equinox, but it can be better. It's also not just for looking at migratory um, routes, they can also be used for um, hibernation strategies, so um, on, on out of uh, buildings. How do, how do I use it? How does it work? So in the northern hemisphere, daylight, um, daylight, daylight hours in the summer are typically longer, uh, are longer in the winter. Um, and so during the uh, summer, the, uh, so the, um, the reading out from the geolocator will give you a time of sunrise and a time of sunset. And from there you can see the latitude as it is always using um, UT, uh, UTC. Then you divide the hours of the day in two to give the time of high noon. High noon is not when your readings will be highest, as that depends on the bird's behavior, where they're foraging in the undergrowth. Um, but what that, so you divide the amount of daylight hours in two, and from that, that will give you your latitude, uh, so your longitude, so where on the world that the birds are. So you see in the winter, the days in the northern hemisphere are shorter and they're longer in the southern hemisphere. So if you have a bird that gives you a reading of a long daylight hours in December, you can assume that it is at a lower uh, latitude. And if the longitude, so from dividing those hours in half, gives you a, a time of high noon at three in the morning, you can then place it on the earth. It's important to remember though, that this doesn't work very well, this doesn't work at all during the equinox because at that time day length is exactly the same throughout the whole world. So whilst you can still get your longitude, uh, your longitude, you won't be able to get your latitude. So you'll be able to tell how far east-west your bird is, but you won't be able to tell how far north-south it is. So just to recap upon the benefits and the limitations, um, they start from very lightweight, so they're great for very tiny uh, species. They have long lifespans, and that's because they are just a very simple light reading device. So they are very efficient with their batteries, so you can get um, the smallest ones you can last for up to a year. And um, they collect data every few minutes, so you get regular data uh, collection and you get daily locations from them. Uh, larger ones are waterproof, so they're great for uh, birds that are in marine conditions and there's and they can you can be they can be customized so depending on uh, what the manufacturer will do um, you can get different options such as 
putting on tubes for a harness or raising the uh, uh, light sensor on a stalk. The limitation, though, is that, as we've touched on this already, is the accuracy. It is only within 200 kilometres and it will not work during the equinox at all. At the current present, there's no remote download options for them. You have to get them back from the birds, so that means they're only really suitable for species that are philopatric or will come back to the same nesting site every single year. And the data analysis process is more involved. There's more steps to do. And there's a greater chance for error. So moving from large distances to ones that are slightly smaller, radio telemetry has been used for decades to study animals of all shapes and sizes. Sizes. This is the traditional method that probably comes to mind for most people when you mention radio tra uh, any sort of tracking, thinking of somebody sat on top of a car waving an antenna around. But over time, they have become much, much smaller and can be used for a much wider range of species. Below Um, and can be used now to track in insects such as hornets and butterflies. The, uh, the radio signal allows you to locate tagged individuals in the field by following the direction of the strongest signal, and that allows you to find them in the field to observe behavior um, or just get a rough location on them. There are additional sensing options available with them as well. So temperature, uh, temperature uh, sensors in them will change the the pulse rate, depending on how warm or cold the animals are. And that can give information on torpor for bats or for uh, lizards. Activity and mortality sensing will change pulse rates depending on how active the animals are, or if the tag hasn't moved for a particular amount of time, the pulse rate will change. And you can, um, and sometimes they will also record time since death in the pulse rates as well. So you can see not only that the tag hasn't moved for 24 hours from the pulse rates, but also how long it has been since the tag moved. So how do I use it? Well, sometimes it is possible to track the tags to the source of the signal and just record a location by getting eyes on the animals. But at other times, this has to be done at a distance using a process called triangulation. I'm just going to demonstrate the basic method for you. So first, a researcher with the receiver and Yagi will detect a signal coming from a tag and the bearing of the strongest signal is recorded either on a map, if you're doing it all analog or GPS. The researcher will then walk around to the other side of the habitat and take another bearing. Where those two locations intersect will be the location of your tagged animal. The more bearings that the researcher can get with this process will increase the accuracy of the location recorded. So I've just shown two here just to, for simplicity's sake. However, um, the, it's probably best you get three or more to really get yourself an accurate uh, reading. There are some common issues with, uh, that, with radio tracking that I'd like to troubleshoot. So one thing to remember is that with a Yagi, you don't just have a lobe coming out the front. You actually have lobes coming out the side and out the back. And so that means you can sometimes hear the tag transmitting from two directions from a reflection. Uh, the best thing to do there is just to turn your gain right down on your receiver and listen for the strongest signal. The weaker of the two signals will be a reflection. The other thing to bear in mind with the Yagi's is that the lobes aren't round. They're actually kind of a squashed ellipsis like this. And so depending on how you're holding your Yagi, whether that is horizontal or vertical, will change the, sh uh, the, uh, the beam shape that you're, uh, of the Yagi. So a vertical orientation, like this one, is greater for sweeping, best for sweeping backwards and forwards to left and right to find the direction of the tag. Whereas a horizontal orientation, like this one, is great for sweeping up and down trees to find the height of the tag. The other, th the other thing is that um, a weak signal doesn't necessarily mean a tag is far away. It can also be due to the animal being in dense vegetation or behind a hill due to topography. When taking, when starting to take locations for triangulation, always try to get a good vantage points uh, with as much elevation as possible. So from the top of the hill for, or uh, even just raising your Yagi on a pole will really help you. It's also worth checking if you are getting weak signals to check your Yagi lead because that we find can also be the source of the problem. 
So to recap on the benefits and the limitations of radio telemetry, they start from very small, 0.13 grams, so you can use them on insects. They're very customizable, and there's a lot of attachment options out there. Uh, out of, these are very reliable. Um, there are ones available with calendar-based programming, so you can choose what days are on and off. And they work with GPS doesn't. Now, what I mean by that is that if you have a bird hunkered down on the ground on a nest, so a ground nesting bird, the GPS may struggle to get a signal up to the satellites. Whereas a radio tag, because that's sending the signal out, um, well, you can find that bird. There are limitations to this as with any technology. So they do require more manual labor. The tags don't record locations. That's up to you to go out with a receiver to do so. The range is limited by antennas. So the bigger your Yagi or the longer the antenna on the receipt on the tag, pardon me, will help increase your range. And small tags have short lifespans of a few days to a few weeks. It's also worth considering that triangulation takes practice, so that can affect the accuracy. Another limitation is that with beeper tags, so the traditional radio tags, they only they all use their own frequencies. So if you're looking at a large group of animals and you're scanning down through all the frequencies to monitor them, it takes a very long time. Coded radio tags get around this with a very uh, clever and simple solution. They embed a code in the tags, like a barcode, and that allows them to all transmit on the same frequency. So you can have multiple animals within one location, all transmitting one frequency, and a receiver listening for all of the, all of the um, codes all at the same time. So it's great for large scale, scale studies or projects where multiple animals will be present at once, like a breeding colony or a um, or a bat roost. It's also great where you could do with a higher resolution of data. So if you are um, scanning down through frequencies on a receiver, you could be sitting for 30 seconds on each frequency and it takes you a long time to get back up to the top of the, the, top list. Of the list. These radio tags weights are also very lightweight. They start from as little as 0.13 grams and can be programmed to turn on and off. Um, so they can uh, transmit for certain hours a day and then turn off again. There's a lot of potential applications for these. And one way expands on um, sort of a basic having your radio in one place. So this is one possible setup. Um, is automated data, data logging, where a data logger is left out at a particular location, so in this case a tree roost, and will just record the presence and absence of individuals. And because they're all on one frequency, it's um, if a bat comes back and it's on a it's tag on the frequency that the receiver just happens not to be looking at at that time, it just comes back in and out really quickly, that event gets missed and it's a false negative. An extension of this, um, I hope you guys had a chance to have a quick look at their website, is the MOTUS network. Um, this is just the location of the ones in, in Europe. Um, it's very widespread across the uh, US. And this has already been used to look at uh, departure directions of birds on migratory stopovers and then migration routes across Europe and America. East Station has multiple antennas to record direction. But as they have larger antennas, they have greater detection range as well. In ideal conditions, uh, they have a five kilometer detection range, but a 12 kilometer detection range with larger, so the big nine elements. So I think this one has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So these are nine elements, and these can go up to 12 kilometers. A five element one, so one's about half the size of these, you're looking at about five kilometers. And this is a really, really clever and simple system. So if you have a tag, an animal tagged over here in Germany, uh, the tag gets registered with a, with a database, the MOTUS database, database. And then if the bird passes a station over here in Belgium or here in the UK, that tag gets locked and the researcher gets notified that their tag was detected. So just to recap on coded tags, they're very small again, and they have a long life because they don't need to, they can, um, they can have long burst intervals up to 30 seconds. 
Um, there are solar powered ones available to keep the to extend the life even more. One frequency you cover many individuals and they're great for placing on strategic places. So uh, feeding stations, colonies. Limitations to consider with these is it is harder to do manual tracking because of the long burst interval and also you need specialist equipment to decode the signal. And keeping with that theme of equipment, there is base station setup and maintenance costs to consider as well. So um, you are looking at uh, a, a few grand to set up a station and then there's the ongoing maintenance costs with powering it um, security, um, and security and other things. So moving on towards satellites, uh, these are ones that uh, in recent years have really come on leaps and bounds in terms of becoming nice and small. And they're fantastic because unlike radio and ge uh, geolocation, it sends everything back remotely, which is lovely. Um, so if your birds migrate and you want to know where they go, that how to capture them, that's where satellite tracking comes in. Um, I love to bring up the first iteration. So the very first satellite tag was a 23 pound elk collar shown here, um, and that was tracked by the NASA's Nimbus, th Nimbus 3 weather satellite. Um, and got a lovely photo of Monique the elf. I think there was two actually, two Moniques um, wearing the collar. I just love showing this photo just to show um, how far the technology has come. So this was, a, uh, say this was 23 pounds, now they're as little as two grams. Um, they have programmable duty cycling, so you can choose what days relocations are recorded. Solar powered options are uh, widely available and you can do ground tracking. So if your tag stops transmitting or start only transmits from one location, you can go to where it is and find it. Uh, different models, so depending on the manufacturer and I recommend discussing this with the manufacturers, have da additional data sensing options such as um, activity or altitude, um, temperature. Um, and other things which, so they just don't do locations anymore, they do other things as well. So how does this work? How does this amazing technology work? Well, a signal is sent from an Argos transmitter known as a PTT, um, which is detected by a satellite passing directly overhead. Using multiple signals from a transmitter, the location is estimated using the Doppler effect. So think about when a ambulance is coming towards you and the pitch of the siren is higher and as it goes away, the pitch gets lower. Um, that is the Doppler effect and that is essentially what is happening when a PT, with a PTT. The calculated locations are then relayed to a, back to a base station and then can be viewed online from the comfort of your computer, which is actually really lovely when you think about it. This has been really useful for identifying wintering areas for birds uh, with better accuracy than geolocation and there's no need to retrieve the tags. So if you're looking at a species that is um, not very site faithful or um, has low recapture rates, this is where this technology really comes into its own. Satellite tracking does have a lot of benefits, very lightweight, two grams and up. Nice long life, depending on model duty cycling. Solar powered is readily available from lots of different manufacturers. They're programmable and your data can be transmitted from anywhere. I did mention ground tracking. That is done using a goniometer. Um, I do apologize if I have um, uh, butchered that pronunciation. Um, so you can go do ground tracking and some have got beacons included, but it is harder to do. There are data costs involved, so you have to pay a fee to Argos to get your data. It's reliant on satellite availability. So the Argos ta uh, satellites at the moment orbit the Earth in a north-south orientation. Um, so there is better coverage at the poles than there are at the equator. The tags have to see the sky to transmit. And this links back to what I said with some of the, some of the species. Um, so if they are very cryptic, if they like to live down in the undergrowth or if they're underground, they're not going to get, it's, it's either going to be very hard or they're not going to get a signal up to, up to Argos at all. And the accuracy is lower than GPS. Um, it's in the kilometers rather than in the meters. So finally, we're going to come on to GPS. Um, and the smallest GPS tags are currently just one gram. 
Uh, you program the tags yourself to take locations at times and dates chosen by you, so you can get just the data that you need. The only data required is to catch the animals, fit the tags, and then in some cases, get the tags back to download the data. The technology has come on massively uh, since it was first introduced, and now GPS tags can record activity, temperature, altitude, orientation, proximity to other tags, and even visual and audio data. Um, this is just uh, so an example of the data that you'd get back from a GPS tag. So each of these dots here is a location recorded. So, and from there, you can look at some um, really cool behavior. So um, this cluster of locations here would indicate this is a roost or a nest. Um, and you can see foraging. So as it goes out over here, so this is a quarry. This is a heathland. Um, this is an urban area. So this is uh, just north of uh yeah this is uh i think this is upton heath just outside bournemouth and uh, you can see foraging flights from this animal as it's gone out gone round and then come back again um so and you'll see red locations so these indicate uh, locations that are less accurate or could be failed um, and the processing of the data will flag up these for you so it's quite hands-off when it comes to processing the data which is lovely so this is slightly different, still uses satellites, but slightly different to satellite tracking. So the GPS system is a system of 30 navigation, 30 plus navigation satellites circling Earth. I've only just put four here, but there are 30 of them. We know where they are at all times because they are tracked from ground stations on Earth. The satellites constantly transmit the time of their onboard computer and the orbital data, so where they are, to Earth. A GPS receiver in the tag listens for these signals that are traveling at the speed of light. And it looks at the time of the tag of the signal being sent versus the time of the signal arriving. And from that, because it knows how quickly the signal arrives, it can then tell how far away from the satellite it is and therefore where the tags are. Um, it does it's best to do this with three or more GPS satellites by and the process is called trilateration. Because this process only needs the tags to receive the signals and record positioning data, they can be much smaller and lighter, it's more passive, so they are a bit more efficient with their batteries. Ideally, the accuracy is within 10 meters, but outliers are not uncommon. GPS has a lot of variety. So the most basic loggers are ones that need to be collected from birds to download data. Those are the very light ones, the ones that are about a gram. So when considering your project, can you recapture the birds? Can, is that not possible? There are multiple options for getting your data back remotely. So there are ones with downloading via uh, radio, so UHF or VHF to, to base stations. Argos, who like the satellites, are using the Argos network. Uh, GSM, using phone networks, or uh, there's the Iridium system, and there's also Icarus, which is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to see how that project develops and where that's going to go. A GPS GSM is really popular because it because it uses a cell phone. It's one of the quickest ways to get data back to you. Argos and Iridium depends upon satellite availability um, and how the tags are programmed, how often they are programmed to send locations up to that network. So. Just to recap, start from just around one gram for a basic logger, customizable, flexible designs, uh, reliable, smart programming. So there are tags out there that can change their programming depending on uh, how active the animals are, where the animals are. So geofencing, if the animal leaves an area, the GPS fixed rate changes or where the animals are. So if an animal goes closer to another one wearing the same tag, the GPS fix will change as well. That links into the additional sensing options, so temperature, activity, um, video and audio data. Solar powered is widely available and remote download, so the convenience of not having to get your tags back, which is lovely. Limitations is that you do need a clear view of the sky to collect the most accurate locations, so species that are um, cryptic uh, can pose a problem. Um, uploading data can be quite power hungry. And that means that remote download options are still too tiny, heavy for tiny species. Um, so for the bats here in the UK, for example, or one of those where it's just not quite there yet. Some may require the additional cost as a limitation, but there is a greater reduced labor cost in comparison to radio. <clears throat> so to consider when planning out a research study. 
So I'd like to thank you guys all very much for listening to me ramble on about uh, tracking technology. And I really look forward to having a discussion about um, uh, answering your questions. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was such a great PowerPoint. Um, that was so clear. I loved how you broke down everything into categories like that. Really good job. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Wonderful. I'm going, Love to, it. <laughs> I'm going to kick us off. We're going to change up the um, the structure of this a little bit. We're going to have a moderator question first, and then we'll we'll get into the audience questions. And this is partially because this is a topic I'm really interested in. Um, <laughs> last year. I talked to a lot of people from the California Condor Recovery Program because we did an article series on um, how that program has grown over the past three decades. And a big part of that program strategy uh, is all about tracking these condors with GPS and DHF units. And that's for population monitoring and for rapid response to incidents like lead poisoning, which is one of the biggest, uh, yes. the biggest challenges that they face. So two things that these biologists mentioned in all of these conversations over and over uh, was the future of integrating GPS and VHF into one wingborne tag. And uh, they also brought up the possibility of using, and I hope I'm about to say this right, I practiced it beforehand, accelerometry to uh, study behavior remotely with those tags. So I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on those innovations? You know, how possible do you think this is? When might we see that? And are there any other integrations or alternate uses for biologging data that could change the way this tech develops? Uh, so that's a really interesting question. So to start off, uh, GPS and VHF combinations are, um, are already in use and you can get ones that are uh, GPS, satellite and VHF where they combine multiple technologies in one device. Accelerometry is also well used within technology, tracking technology to look at um, animal behavior. But if you're putting it on the wing, that could pose an issue because it would always be, I know condors saw, so you could use that for um, looking at difference between when they're actually flapping or when they're, when they're soaring, when they're roosting. Um, so that would probably require calibration on the, on the part of the research when they get the tags. Um, the tags themselves were called um, X, Y, Z or, opt, uh, or another one called Opta. So they will look at the, um, the pitch of the animal. So if it's going up or down, um, whether it's going forward um, or whether it's rolling. Um, and some tags out there on the market already will change the GPS schedule. So if they sense that activity has gone above a particular threshold, they will start recording much faster or if it's gone below, it'll go slower, or vice versa, you know, it's, it's, it's flexible to do. Um, I suppose the main thing possibly might be weight, um, and that's probably one of the limitations for the condor researchers at the moment, is that if you're putting something on the bird's wing, I know that's a standard with condors, um, that, that's probably the limitation there. So that's probably where the technology is going right now, it's making things smaller, lighter, and more efficient with their batteries. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we'll we'll get into the audience questions. Uh, all right, so first we have Rob Sinclair, um, who says his mic may not be working. We'll see if he can get in here. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Hello. go ahead, okay. Rob. Yes, fantastic. First of all, fantastic uh, presentation. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, my question was about the radio telemetry and the potential range that you can get from different antennas. You, can you, I'm brand new to this, so can you just give me a sense of what sort of the maximum range you might get? So if you're considering um, using radio telemetry, uh, do think about what environment you're using it in and what species you are. So if you're using it in highly mountainous regions with species that are quite cryptic, so they like hiding down inside the vegetation, that will limit your, your, your range no matter how big your, receive, your antennas are. Um, that will still limit the range because the radio signal will be impeded by the topography um, and by the um, antennas itself. Um, so the the 15 kilometer was when they were pointed straight out to sea. So the the rule of the rule of thumb generally is um, the more the more elements on your antenna, the greater the decibel, the greater the gain. So the greater the range. But um, thinking they, it narrows the beam. So think about when you're um, you're using a hose pipe and you narrow the nozzle on the hose pipe. 
and it goes from a wide spray down to a narrow spray. It goes further, but it's much narrower. Um, nice. So if you're if you're track so if you're doing handheld tracking on the ground with a Yagi handheld Yagi, um, you're looking sort of maybe up to around three kilometers under ideal conditions. Um, and um, you can also, or if you're using like a stationary one, um, so a five element one, um, that can go further some more kilometers. But there is no hard and fast rule on that. So right. you can say if you have six elements, you're definitely going to get this distance. Right. Perfect. That oh, that's sense. very helpful. Thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Um, and Sarah, if I could get you to um, stop sharing the screen. Oh, I'm because so sorry. No, no, it's no problem. It's just apparently <laughs> it looks it looks a little funny in the recording. It looks fine for us during this, but it'll it'll cut off the people asking the Q&As, which is what Tatiana has just just told me happens. Um, so our next question is from Carly. Carly, I know you have a mic, so uh, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, don't I? I mean, my voice carries enough that do I really need the mic? It's I probably travels across the Atlantic on its own. Um, hi, this was hi. Uh, really, really amazing. I kind of so your lovely tables of like limitations and pros and cons and whatever. Uh, if you were going to add like a third column to each of these that was associated with cost, um, okay. where like what would how would that factor into all of this because our like we so I I'm a mammologist birders don't hate me please um but the biggest thing for us is not necessarily I study lemurs is not necessarily like size or anything because they are fairly like big mm. but cost like cost. we just cannot afford gps collars mm -hmm. and so i wondered how you would kind of factor cost into these kind of pros and cons of each yeah absolutely um so the the pros of um more advanced technology such as gps is that you can get things back remotely and the locations are recorded without you having to be in the field However, with radio, the costs of the equipment tend to be lower, though you have to think about receivers. So collars run, let's say collars run for about 200, 300 pounds. Um, then you have to put a receiver on top of that and receivers cost about one and a half. I'm doing this in GBP, by the way. Um, <laughs> so de depending on where you are in the world, different, you know, different costs there, but then you have to think about the receiver. But then you also have to consider the manual tracking. So um, I'm just gonna use a little bit of personal experience here. When, it, we were looking for a tag that fell off an animal and it probably took us a good two, three hours to find it under a bush. So when you think about them and you also have to, so if you're tracking, le is it lemurs, right? Did I get that right? Lemurs, fantastic. Um, uh, the, you have to think about the manual cost of going into the field, getting into the field, tracking the animals in the field, um, uh, and you know, if you're in dense jungles like that, I can imagine that would also impede the signal. Um, that's a very good point. I think uh, that's something I could add to this in the future as an extra thing is costs of um, getting the data. You know, and it's time. It's more more with radio track. It's, it's time more than anything. And um, with geolocators, it's time catching the birds, catching them again. Um, the risk of you're not going to always catch all the same birds again. So if you put out 60 geolocators, you might only get five back, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, um, sorry, I rambled on a bit, but I hope that answers your question. No, yeah, that's that's super helpful. Um, do you kind of as a follow up, do you have specific like brands or companies that you would recommend for any of these kind of technologies? Well, we are so. I'm going to be honest. We are so. We 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 make them. So I would later. We make them. Um, but there's also the companies out there. So off the top of my head, I can think of uh, TechnoSmart. Uh, um, I just know the ones. I just know really the other ones. So there's PathTrack. Then there's EcoTen. Then there's TechnoSmart. Uh, then there is Microwave CTT, so cellular, cellular tracking technologies in the US. Um, 
And there's one beginning with a V, who I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, uh, the other one, the other thing as well, if you're looking to see um, what technology is out there, is to look at publications that have used them, because in the publications they will tell you who made the tags. Um, and there's also a growing community of people making them themselves um, as well. So sort of um, coming up with their own designs. And I think Nigel Butcher covered that in an earlier tech tutors session. Yes, I am by no, I am like on the ecology conservation side of things. And oh, don't ATS, trust sorry, my another, ATS Hollow Hill. There we go. There's some more. <laughs> um, so I like the the tech programming engineering stuff just absolutely like um and so it's yeah good to good to hear kind of in in plain terms like what i basically just want like point me to a like buy page on the internet for something good and like Let's hope I cannot DIY nor trust myself to DIY anything. I mean, with, with that, it's I think it'd be worth in, in talking to talk, definitely talking to the manufacturers because I mean, we uh, personally, I don't I don't mind people to come to us with questions and I'm sure neither of them do either. Um, uh, we'll we'll come. Yes, I can see that uh, someone else was putting names into the chat. Thank you very much for finding those. Do you want to give a shout out to um, our, the other guys who are also in this for us, um, um, who are also in the same industry as us? Um, and I'd recommend because there's not really a straightforward. You buy the tag and that's it. There's a lot of conversation back and forth between us and you as the researcher because everything is customly done. So we're, we're talking to you about the species. We're talking to you about what the species does, how the species behaves, because we want to make sure that when you get the product, it works and it doesn't affect what the animals are doing. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in the chat who's posting lots of other things. Um, I'm seeing that Laura is uh, coming up and we have a Tech Tutors episode on that in a couple mm -hmm. weeks. So we do. Yeah. Thank you for the plug. It is on the 11th of February, I believe, is when that one is coming. So everyone keep an eye out for uh, for when registration for that opens, if you're interested. Um, OK, our next question is from Erna, who does not have a mic. So I'll go ahead and read this one out. So um, this person works at a raptor rehabilitation center in Indonesia, and um, they are planning to develop an affordable mobile-based GPS data logger to help post-release monitoring. So what they're looking to know um, is if you have any tips to make the battery last longer but still weigh under 30 grams for medium-sized eagles. And uh, this is really focusing on at least the two-week period of intense post-release monitoring. um probably to spread out the locations um so they're looking to develop it themselves so bravo on you you know that's 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 a fantastic undertaking um it would probably be if you're looking something under 30 grams um the main thing there will probably be your battery so you're gonna you're not gonna be able to take very intensive schedules you might have to spread them out a bit um yeah, uh, but that one might be worth dropping us a message or putting on. Uh, if you put on the forum, I'll get back to mm -hmm. them. That's right. And um, I think because I can I can pa I can pass that one on to our engineers and see. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, um, my, my colleague Brian is also around in the chat as well. So, um, I mean, uh, Brian, do you have any? Uh, do you want to weigh in on this one or? Uh... Yeah, Brian, if you'd like to jump in and Hello, Brian. <laughs> if, you, if you've got a mic, feel free to come in and give us an answer. Do you want to on this one, Brian? Because I think you might have a... Yes, hello. Um, yeah, basically, um, there's two elements to a tag. There's electronics and there's a battery. Uh, and there's packaging, actually, which is also very critical. So it's how you make it, how you protect it from the uh, outside world and from the animal and from the elements. Um, so... And, and getting them really small is not easy. You, you can't just go out and buy a module. And if you do the, uh, the design yourself, you need to really know what you're doing. So getting below 30 grams, um, you could possibly do it with a, with a sort of um, what we call an OEM module you just buy off the internet. Um, and then uh, pretty much as Sarah said, it's, 
it, most of the power is used when you're actually t taking a fix with GPS. So the more fixes you take, the more power you use. So the fewer you take per unit time, the longer it lasts. So that's so getting the schedule right is probably quite an important factor. Um, the other important thing is how you how you uh, get the data back. If you use a store on board tag, so this is a tag which simply collects data, nothing else. That's the most energy efficient because all you're doing is receiving signals and processing them to get the data. If you want to retransmit it, you're then using more power to retransmit and transmitters are usually more powerful than receivers. So especially if you're transmitting to satellites. So so that so if you're looking for I think you called it a remote. I'm not quite sure what you meant by that, but a remote um, tag. Um, if that if that's implying that it's going to remotely transmit the data as a whole level of complexity higher, so it's much more difficult to do, but also you use far more power to do it. Unfortunately, sometimes our animals are too smart. And we can't catch them again, so we don't have much choice other than to to retransmit data. But for a 30 gram tag, making your own tag, retransmitting data. Might might be a struggle. Talk to Nigel Butcher. I think he he offered to help because um, he he does this sort of thing and uh, he's he's in a better position to advise I think than we are. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, great. And this is a message for Erna and everyone else in the in this call who might have questions that they would like to ask our our tech tutors, whether that's Sarah or whether that's Nigel, who of course was also one of our tech tutors. Um, we do have the tech tutors forum, so you can always head over to Wild Labs. Um, a link should be dropping to that in just a second in the chat. You can always keep these conversations going. If there's someone specific who you would really like to talk to in there, let us know. We'll make sure to flag them down and let them know that they, you're looking to get in touch with them. Um, so we have time for about two more questions, depending. Um, Oh, and never mind. It looks like Nigel and Jared are here in the chat uh, <laughs> right now. So let's see if they would like to jump in right now. We do have time. We've got about 10 minutes left, but sometimes these episodes run over. So if everyone is happy to stick around a few extra minutes, if we happen to run over. Um, Nigel, Jared, are you here? Oh, Hi, yeah. Hi, Hello. How are you? Yes, um, so um, I mean, as Brian said, there's kind of OEMs and things out there. I mean, you can uh, do bits and pieces yourself, but kind of rounds of 30 grams. The, um, the specialist companies like Low Tech, or, uh, Sarah's representing there, um, do a lot of the smaller stuff. But yeah, if you kind of know a little bit yourself, you can find things in the realms of those. And yeah, kind of like for, for um, bigger raptors and uh, livestock and things like that, you can kind of build yourself one, but it's yeah, very important to obviously test it properly. And then, uh, yeah, the um, housing, the weatherproof in it yeah, is important as well. So yeah, that can add weight. So you have to think about it once you, you know, at the bottom end, some of these little things that the small grams or two soon add up. So you kind of sometimes lose that, you have what you want to put in solar or battery to to produce what you you want uh, the 30 grams will soon be swallowed up so you you need to consider that and yeah get all your in individual bits weighed up and assembled and then and see what you got to work with for the solar and battery element at the end and the housing yeah yeah absolutely i mean there's some that people do themselves um i'm just trying to remember the i got you to, the i got you gps is quite popular for people in the seabird community um and they will get those they repackage those those have to be got i think those ones you have to get them back um from the birds um there's other ones people will take pet trackers for example um and they'll take those apart and put them back in their own uh casings but i mean uh, uh thinking like a normal cat tracker is about 50 grams but you could probably strip away some of that um uh, and start with just the the bare, the bare bones have we yeah. we also have another uh expert here i think she's still here uh, Virginie from, I, I always feel like I'm about to mispronounce this, Zirius, Zirius. <laughs> Hello, are you, <laughs> I'm, I keep putting people on the spot. I know she's, I see her, she is here and she is an expert on uh, developing this kind of technology. We did a case study with her last year as well. So if she would like to jump in, um, <laughs> feel free to turn on your mic and camera if you're, if you're prepared.
Okay. If she if she happens to jump in, um, we can we can backtrack. But we do have about six minutes left in the official episode before we go into overtime. So I would like to ask a couple questions from our event right registration questions. Um, I don't believe any of these people are here, but this is a good chance to uh, let these people catch up later in the recordings. So one of these questions just really captured my heart uh, when I saw it. And I think this question is is important because, you know, sometimes these calls are very expert level and it's people who are looking to develop these big projects. And then sometimes we have people who are coming for sort of more personal projects and people who are looking to just test out this technology for themselves for the first time. I don't know this person's story. I don't know why exactly they're asking this, but the question is, can I track my goose live on my laptop and phone? And to me, this sounds like maybe it's someone who is just trying this out. Maybe they've got a goose one goose that they would really like to track. This might be their first experience with tracking yeah. technology. So is there anything that this person could try out and are there capabilities for someone to use personal tracking technology for one animal on uh, their own devices? So if this is a pet goose, I would recommend pet tracking, but the consideration is how you're going to attach it. Geese are quite difficult uh, when it comes to attaching them. Um, maybe it is a very malicious food. Um, so you could use, uh, uh, you could, so there's the casing, so you have to make sure that it's goose proof uh, from, not just from the goose itself, from its environment, it's given on the water, so you have to make sure that it's waterproof. Um, you can, in short, yes, so there are ones out there, so for um, Marshalls, uh, another company who makes stuff more for raptors, so their stuff is more in real time. So they're designed for um, <clears throat> these areas as well. Um, I do do forgive me, Virginia, for 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 not listing you earlier. Um, they uh, those ones you can track in real time uh, for from your phone or from a computer, um, and that is something people do want, obviously, because it means you don't have to go out. You don't have to get any specialist extra equipment. So for that, if it's a pet goose, I'd say pet trackers, but consider repackaging it. Something that's goose-proof. All right, very good, goose-proof. And um, so our last question that we're going to close with is quite a big one from Rob, and I, I'd kind of like to tag team this one with you, Rob. So uh, go ahead, and then I'll add on. Um, we'll, we'll we'll take this one together because I have some questions too about the future. Hi, Sarah. Um, great talk. Uh, yeah, my question was um, just a sort of a, a future gazing question about where you see the technology heading in the next five years or so. Oh, I'd love to see it go smaller. Um, Brian, you're also welcome to weigh in on this one as well. If there's any way you want it, because yeah, Brian um, has been in. Uh, how, how long have you been tracking, Brian? I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> <laughs> For about 40 years, I suppose. Yeah. Um, do, do you want me to answer, Sarah? Hmm? Yeah. So do you want, do you want me to answer? Do you want me to answer? Yeah, yeah, sort of I guesswork mean, anyway, I, isn't short, it? Short, mine would be smaller. That's where I'd like to <laughs> Smaller, <see it>. yeah. <laughs> smaller, lower powered, more sophisticated. Um, yeah, it, I mean, the, the, the um, tracking technology for animals is really driven by, by, uh, by these things. You know, what happens in mobile phones? Because uh, that's where all the you, you need loads and loads of money to develop new chips, uh, which um, and and only the really big commercial markets, all the big consumer markets, have that kind of money for development. So we rely on chips that are developed for that purpose, and then we use them in in tracking tags. But somebody asked earlier about accelerometers, um, and there's also things called um, 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 magnetometers, which are essentially like, like compasses. Uh, and you imagine a tag which can which contains not only GPS but also uh, a compass which can sample the direction of the bird, you know, at, at one second intervals or even faster, plus the accelerometer which measures the orientation of the bird, uh, and you've got some fantastically detailed data about the really fine scale movements of the bird. So you can detect every wing beat and every footstep. Um, that that's I think that is is going to be very important in the future. Not just knowing where the bird is, but knowing exactly what it's doing. Every every twitch of a wing, 
that that would be really exciting that's already available the trouble is it creates masses and masses and masses of data unbelievable amounts of data and they're all on the tag and you've got to get them off the tag and uh, transmitting you need huge bandwidth if you're going to retransmit so these things are usually confined to store on board tags where you have to get the tag back which which is quite difficult so i'd say that's the future accelerometers 3d accelerometers 3d magnetometers that's that's watch out for that all right and um assuming that you know problems like connectivity and problems like making things as lightweight as they need to be and actually getting the data off of these things assuming in the next decade those are solved and we have easy solutions i don't know if this will happen, but assuming it does, um, what would your dream tracking system look like if you could design something yourself that has all the features you could want and you don't need to worry about any of these common problems? Yes. Um, Sarah, do you want to answer that one? Or do um, you want me to do I think it, it would just be talk? something that's kind of almost like uh, the little thing that you put in your keys that you, when you whistle, it makes a noise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'd love something, that'd be really fun, or something almost like a um, uh, a metal detector. So you can get, a, you can get a, a, a direction on the tag much easier with a mobile phone, something that like a receiver device, a receiver really that could plug into a mobile phone or a tablet. I think that'd be, that'd be what I'd love to see in the future. Um, so, um, means that you can upload, a, you could use a mobile phone app to um, load up a list of frequencies and tags and all that kind of stuff and the, and the phone can do all the GPS tracking of where you are and recording all of the signals. A bit like drone pilots use nowadays uh, for controlling drones. That's why, let's say, like an app that's a receiver. Yeah, well, that's the way things are going. I mean, an awful lot of biologists so when I first started tracking, the only way to do it really was to go out with a handheld antenna and wander about listening for a beeping signal. Um, and it's come a long way since then. But still, when you're doing that, you're out in the field, you're actually out there with your species. Uh, and there's a lot to be said for that. And most of us who are involved in this, we really love the field work. So it's a double edged sword when modern technology allows you to get all your data directly to your computer without going out in the field. You miss that bit. You miss a bit of going out in the field. You, you still have to go out to put the tag on, so that so it's not so bad. But um, I, I think, uh, yeah, the, the dreams the dream system is always it just comes to your computer. All the data comes to your computer. You can analyze it, um, but you miss out on being out there with your birds. All right, brilliant. And I think that's a really good way to to close this episode. Um, I think we can all relate to that, which is. Uh, you know, this technology, we want to see it progress as far as possible, but we also really enjoy nature, all of us, and that's why people are in conservation. So I think we would miss something of that. I think you're right. Um, thank you, Sarah, for this incredible episode. This was so much fun. Thank you, Brian, for jumping in here at the end and being sort of a secondary tech tutor. Um, and thank you to everybody for attending, asking your questions.